The Hits. Sí, eso. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Gregory Stockel will bring us this week's education report. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Ashley and Mario Ritter Jr. tell us about online learning in South Korea. Like many students around the world, children in South Korea are struggling with distance learning because of coronavirus health restrictions. Many are taking online classes from home. Some experts say the reduced interaction with teachers, digital distractions, and technical difficulties are making it hard for students. This is especially the case if they have problems learning or are from poor families. Han Shin Bi has struggled during at-home learning. She is a senior in high school in Seoul. Online classes are really inconvenient, she told the Associated Press. I ended up with a bad grade on an exam because I didn't really focus on studying while online. For students who were doing well before the health crisis, things have been less difficult. They often come from middle and upper class families. They have had an easier time keeping their grades up. They often have family support if they run into trouble. South Korea is considered by many to be an education-obsessed country. People place great importance on getting good jobs with big companies. The university that a South Korean young person attends can decide many things about that person's future, job possibilities, social groups, and even who they can marry. Gu Bong Chang is policy director of a non-governmental organization called World Without Worries About Shadow Education. Gu said, It is a mistake to believe that a person's educational history and their ability are the same. A recent government study of 51,021 teachers showed that about 80% of those questioned saw an increasing difference between their strongest and weakest students. To deal with the problem, the education ministry has employed part-time teachers to help 29,000 students in elementary schools. Some teachers have been asked to temporarily work with about 2,300 high schoolers who are struggling. Some students have problems when teachers mostly pre-record talks online. Han, for example, could not ask questions in real time. In addition, her family does not have enough money to pay a tutor or send her to a cram school, like most of her friends. If I had had lots of money, I think I could have learned many things. And I actually wanted to learn English and Chinese at cram schools, she said. Even some highly successful students say distance learning is difficult. I felt I was trapped at the same place, and I got lots of psychological stress, said Ma Sobin, a high school senior at a costly foreign language school near Seoul. Ma added that it was hard not to have friends for support. 
South Korea restarted in-person classes in steps in May. Officials let high school seniors return first. The idea was to let the seniors prepare for the National University Entrance Exam in December, possibly the biggest test in their lives. Younger students returned later, but in a limited way that still requires most of them to take online classes at home. In June, hundreds of thousands took a nationwide test to prepare for the December exam. In that test, the number of students with high-ranking scores increased in the three important subjects, Korean, English, and math. To experts, this suggested the questions were easier than an earlier test. But the number of those with the lowest scores also increased. Kang Min-jung is a South Korean lawmaker and a member of an education committee. Kong said, The results suggest that educational polarization has become severe. Lim Song-ho is with the private Jungro Academy in Seoul. Lim said the health crisis is worsening the educational difference between rich and poor. A study by the Education Ministry and the National Statistics Office last year found that 75% of South Korean students used some form of private education. Families spent an average of $377 each month. Middle and higher income families spent five times more for private education than lower income families. Ma's parents both work for a private English institute. Ma said they pay about $1,750 a month for their daughter's private education and $17,550 a year for her schooling and living costs. They said it is worth the cost given how important education is to her future. I have no regrets, said Ma's father, Ma Moon Young. Y. H. Yoon is a single mother of three children in Seoul. She worries her sons will not be able to keep up because she cannot send them to cram school. She needs to work instead of helping them while they study at home. But she urges them to study hard, even through the difficulties and the coronavirus crisis, so that they can one day get into good universities. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. And I'm Ashley Thompson. Educators and officials in Utah have been concerned about the effects of COVID-19-related restrictions and closures on children's education. But activists say the closures are hardest for those who were already struggling in school, local refugees and immigrants. Halima Ali is an activist for the state's Somali refugee community. She noted that even under normal conditions, refugee children are often in need. Their parents are new to the United States and they do not know our education system, she said. In some cases, the parents may have had little schooling, so COVID-19 made the situation worse. Ali and her family immigrated from Somalia long before the start of the coronavirus health crisis. She said it was a struggle to feel at ease in their new homeland. 
For many families where the parents did not receive much education, it can be even worse. This was the case for Salman Youssef, whose family immigrated to Utah in 2018. When I came here, I didn't know how to read and write, he said. And I was learning, but then COVID-19 came. And it is still hard for me to read and write. But a local nonprofit group helped Yusef find his way, both in the classroom and as a runner. Mike and Christy Spence launched Athletics United as a running club after they found that many refugee children needed help with their schoolwork. Their hope was to unite the community and make children more physically active. The group used to hold tutoring sessions two times a week at the public library in Logan, Utah. But those meetings were halted in March because of measures designed to slow the spread of COVID-19. Library officials have yet to let private groups back into the building. Like every other industry, Athletics United had to think differently to meet the new rules on physical distancing. Mike Spence told the Associated Press that the past three years have been a very important time for the group. He said it has used word of mouth and friendships to help with individual students' needs. For many refugees, language barriers are the root of many problems. Spence, for example, helps tutor Yusef once a week because there are not enough teachers for all the students. Teachers sometimes are not available for you because they've got meetings, he said. They got other things to do, too. You can't really stay after school because of the COVID-19 stuff. But before, when we needed to get help after school, but it was not enough, you would still get help from the program. Frank Schofield heads the Logan City School District. He said the push to get students to build relationships with teachers was important to creating trust. He said this is similar to how Athletics United operates. The club has served the Logan community for years and proved helpful to refugees and immigrants or anyone who needs help. Schofield added that if we don't have in-person, face-to-face learning, we know that those challenges are greater for those families because of a lack of access to technology in many cases. Providing computers and other technology to students helps, but the system is not perfect. Yusef's cousin, Mal Lidner, has been with the group for a long time. The two attended Logan High School together. He said that finding extra help can be difficult and often depends on the teacher. It's just always, if you have any question or anything, send me an email, he said. It's only through email, and when I email, you never know how long they might take them to respond. It might take days, hours, minutes, however long, and it depends on your teacher. Yusef's niece, Sabrine, attends Thomas Edison Charter School South. She said while it was a similar struggle at first, the school was able to add two new tutors to help. In the past four weeks, Spence has started up more running groups. The club used to meet at Ellis Elementary School. Spence and several volunteers now meet two times a week in two different locations. He said this gives the children something to look forward to and a chance to get together in as safe an environment as possible. I'm Gregory Stockel. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, 
visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In October of 1859, a group of anti-slavery extremists attacked the town of Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry was part of Virginia then. Today, it is located in West Virginia. The attackers were led by John Brown. They seized a gun factory and a federal supply center where military equipment was kept. They planned to use the guns and equipment to organize a rebel army of slaves. Harry Monroe and Kay Gallant tell us what happened to John Brown after he seized Harper's Ferry. The President of the United States in 1859 was James Buchanan. When Buchanan learned of the attack, he wanted immediate action. He sent a force of Marines to Harper's Ferry under the command of Army Colonel Robert E. Lee. John Brown had attacked with about 20 men. Several including two of his sons, had been killed by local militia. He and his remaining men withdrew to a small brick building. The attack had failed. Not one slave had come to Harper's Ferry to help Brown. The few whom his men had freed had refused to fight, when the shooting started. Brown could not understand the fear that kept the slaves from fighting for their freedom. Brown and his men were trapped inside the brick building. They held a few hostages whom they hoped to exchange for their freedom. Colonel Lee wrote a message to John Brown demanding his surrender. He did not think Brown would surrender peaceably. So he planned to attack as soon as Brown rejected the message. He felt this was the surest way to save the lives of the hostages. As expected, Brown refused to surrender. He said he and his men had the right to go free. As soon as Brown spoke, the signal was given. The Marines attacked. They broke open a small hole in the door of the brick building. One by one, the Marines moved through the hole. They fought hand to hand against the men inside. After a brief fight, they won. John Brown's rebellion was crushed. A few hours after Brown was captured... The governor of Virginia and three congressmen arrived in Harper's Ferry. They wanted to question Brown. Brown had been wounded in the final attack. He was weak from the loss of blood, but he welcomed the chance to explain his actions. The officials first asked where Brown got the money to organize his raid. Brown said he raised most of it himself. He refused to give the names of any of his supporters. Then the officials asked why Brown had come to Harper's Ferry. We came to free the slaves, Brown said, and only that. He continued, I think that you are guilty of a great wrong against God and humanity. 
I believe anyone would be perfectly right to interfere with you so far as to free those you wickedly hold in slavery. I think I did right. You had better, all you people of the South, prepare yourselves for a settlement sooner than you are prepared for it. You may get rid of me very easily. I am nearly gone now. But this question is still to be settled, this Negro question, I mean. That is not yet ended. The raid on Harper's Ferry increased the bitterness of the national dispute over slavery. Members of the Democratic Party called the raid a plot by the Republican Party. Republican leaders denied the charge. They said the raid was the work of one man, one madman, John Brown. Still, they said, he had acted for good reason, to end slavery in America. Southern newspapers condemned Brown. Some said his raid was an act of war. Some demanded that he be executed as a thief and murderer. Many Southerners said all of the North was responsible for the raid. They believed all Northerners wanted a slave rebellion in the South. And it was such a rebellion that Southerners feared more than anything else. New measures were approved throughout the South to prevent this. Military law was declared in some areas. Slave owners threatened to beat or hang any Negro who even looked rebellious. The fear of a slave rebellion united the people of the South. For years, rich slave owners had talked of taking the southern states out of the Union to save their way of life. But those who had no slaves opposed the idea of disunion. John Brown's raid changed that. After his attack on Harper's Ferry, the South spoke with one voice. All Southerners declared that they would fight to protect their homes from a Negro rebellion or from another attack by men like Brown. Feelings were especially high in Virginia, the state in which the raid took place. Virginians wanted Brown punished quickly to show what would happen to anyone who tried to lead a Negro rebellion. There was some question whether Brown should be tried in a federal court or a state court. Brown's raid took place within the borders of a state, but the property he seized belonged to the federal government. The governor of Virginia decided to try Brown in a state court. He believed a federal court trial would take too long. If Brown were not brought to trial quickly, he said, people might attack the jail and kill him. was being held in Charlestown, a few kilometers from Harper's Ferry. The court there named two lawyers to defend him. A doctor examined Brown. He reported that Brown's wounds were not serious enough to prevent the trial from starting. 
Brown lay in a bed in the courtroom throughout the trial. John Brown's lawyers tried to show that his family had a history of madness. They tried to prove that Brown, too, was mad. They asked the court to declare him innocent because of insanity. Brown protested. He said the lawyers were just trying to save his life. He did not want such a defense. The matter of insanity was dropped. Brown's lawyers then argued that he was not guilty of the three crimes with which he was charged. First, they said, he could not be guilty of treason against Virginia because he was not a citizen of Virginia. Second, he could not be guilty of plotting a slave rebellion because he had never incited slaves against their owners. And third, he could not be guilty of murder, because he had killed only in self-defense. The trial lasted five days. The jury found John Brown guilty of all three charges. The judge asked Brown... If he wanted to make a statement before being sentenced, Brown did. He declared that he had not planned to start a slave rebellion. He said he only wanted to free some slaves and take them to Canada. Brown's statement was strong, but it was not true. He had, in fact, planned to organize an army of slaves to fight for their freedom. He acted in the belief that slaves throughout the South would rise up against their owners and join him. Brown's words did not move the judge. He said he could find no reason to question the jury's decision that Brown was guilty. He sentenced Brown to be hanged. One of Brown's supporters attempted to find a way to free Brown from jail. Several plans were proposed. None were tried. Brown himself did not want to escape. He said he could do more to destroy slavery by hanging than by staying alive. John Brown was executed on December 2nd, 1859. His death created a wave of public emotion throughout the country. In the North, people mourned. One man wrote, The events of the last month or two have done more to build Northern opposition to slavery than anything which has ever happened before than all the anti-slavery pamphlets and books that have ever been written. In the South, people cheered, but their happiness at Brown's punishment was mixed with anger at those who honored him. As the nation prepared for a presidential election year, the South renewed its promise to defend slavery or leave the Union. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.